Welcome fathers who are looking to inspire their kids and become fearless. This is the Become a Fearless Father show and I'm your host, Klaas van Oosterhout. I'm a father of two boys, husband and entrepreneur. This show is created to teach you how to take control and enjoy the most difficult job you've ever faced, fatherhood. I'm going to keep it real and share real life experience. A heads up, there is no magic pill. You will have to put in the hours, sweat and tears to achieve victory. Are you ready to improve your health, wealth, relationships, knowledge and become the hero your family needs you to be? I know you are. So get your pen and paper ready and let's become fearless fathers together. All right, so welcome everybody to another live interview with Become a Fearless Father. I got the pleasure today to have David Me on. Uh, we got connected through Facebook, started chatting a little bit, got excited about each other's content and decided, hey, why not? Let's go live. And I'm like, yep. And he's like, absolutely. So, you know, sometimes things yeah. happen well, amazingly between um, positive people that want to make a huge impact because I have the feeling, David, that that's absolutely you. Um, before we dive into who is David, right? Um, I, I'm trying something new since last time and just just getting like a really nice question in and let's start right. off with this one one of your uh, pages is called break through your barriers so let's dive into that a little bit what does that mean how did that came about and why and most importantly the question why is it so important to break through your barriers Yeah, awesome. Great question. Um, <clears throat> the breakthrough of your barriers came about because <clears throat> my wife and I um, had always struggled in our marriage. Um, we both were very, I guess, uh, in the, I guess we were both very emotionally immature. Got married and for like the first 10 years of our marriage. And um, I, I had always had a porn addiction and um, about seven, eight years ago, I had an affair, um, and I had, I was also addicted to alcohol at the same time. So there was a lot going on and it was, you know, yeah, it, it was bad. So I <coughs> guess at that point, uh, when the affair came out, <clears throat> I guess I had a personal breakthrough at the same time mm -hmm. in a core belief about myself, um, and I guess from that point, I didn't know, like at that point, I didn't know that I'd had a, had a breakthrough. I just, I just felt this big shift inside me to do with self-worth um, and how I viewed myself because I always had chronic lack of self-worth. You know, no, no, I wasn't valid, had no self-worth. So, mm. And so from that point, we began to rebuild and regrow. You know, so for the last seven years, it's been rebuilding our relationship <clears throat> and going through lots of other, I guess we had a lot of other breakthroughs as well. Um, and so when we got to a point where we thought we're at a place in our marriage where we can actually, we can help people who have been through infidelity, who have been through, you know, have porn addiction and want to rebuild and simply because we've been there, not on a professional level, but on a level of we can walk through you with, we can walk with you through this. So I guess that's where Breakthrough Marriage Mentoring started. That was like mm. the start of 2018 or the end of 2017. Because of that, we both felt like there had been a breakthrough and that was the best way. That's what really resonated with us, you know, because I was so stuck. Well, we were both stuck, but I was really stuck before that. Mm. And, um, and so there, yeah, that has then evolved and grown. Um, so now Naomi, my wife, works with women, um, and I work, I work a lot with men. Mm -hmm. And so the breakthrough of barriers evolved for me from my own personal journey and then from all the experience and all, um, you know, so much growth, so much learning, and then realizing, hey, I can actually help people. Um, I can I actually have a gift. Like, suddenly discovering your gifts as you go through this process. Mm. I actually have a gift to help other people break through and discover their limiting self-beliefs and their core values and 
and get them to a place where by themselves they would stay in that place for years, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So I guess that's that's the very condensed version, but that's it in a nutshell. Um, mm-hmm. The breakthrough your barrier. Um, and so that's there where the Breakthrough Your Barriers community was formed as well. So that's so that's then men who are we're all there to help each other. We've all everybody has wisdom. Everybody has been through an experience, everybody has gone through challenges, no matter how bad we might feel about ourselves. We've all been through something. We can all help somebody on some part of our journey. And so that's the basis of the of the community as well. Mm-hmm. Is that everybody can learn from everybody. Um mm-hmm. And I just really love it. Um, and the guys seem to really be responding and offering their advice and their solutions and their experience. So. Mm. That's nice. Yeah, that's, that's something that's lacking, you know, a, a place or, or just, just something where men can communicate because that's not innately taught to us by, <laughs> by our environment or our parents. We just need to be tough and suck it up, boy. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. So, great. I appreciate it, David. What we learned, or what I've learned so far from you, is that you're very open and honest. I mean, who would be willing to share immediately that they had and alcoholic problems and porn addiction and, uh, you know, uh, cheated on um, their wife so openly as you just did? So, I appreciate you sharing that, and I can't wait for the other questions. And before we start, David, share with us a little yep. bit more your background and. Um, yeah, where where are you at right now? Sure. Um, yeah, I guess I haven't always been open. In fact, I've always been an extremely closed person most mm. of my life. I've not sh- I've not shared with I don't really open up to anybody about anything. Really, it's one mm. of I was one of those people. Um, yeah, so we grew up in a. I was a the fourth fourth child last child um and five years between myself and my next older brother so i i spent a lot of time by myself and kind of uh i brought myself up in a lot of ways mm. um and you know so being the, the last child is kind of you're there and you know it, it wasn't all bad but just um, um, sure, parents think crash because they've already taught it for three other kids and gone through things. So I tended to get missed a lot when it came to, I guess, proactive kind of, uh, you know, emotional coping skills, all things that, that really help adults and later in life, that sort of thing. Uh, I just somehow missed all of that. And, um, so I got married and had a had a porn addiction from from very young. You know, I was always I could never really understand it whether or not it's a personality thing or what the story was, but I was always very, you know, attracted to sexuality, you know, from a very, very young age. So as soon as magazines and things became available and then the internet, it was a natural thing for me. Um so yeah, the porn addiction was right from childhood and I never did break it. Um, right through our marriage, um, I tried not for lack of trying, mind you. Um, like because we grew up in a very conservative Christian mm-hmm. uh, house, so it was very, um, you know, this the sense of shame and guilt and the cycle of asking for forgiveness and then doing it again and this whole shame and guilt and on, on and on and on it went. Um, so that's kind of you know, very loose ground. You know, teenagehood, I remember quite fondly as far as we were out in the country. So I got to do a lot of things with guys, um, you know, out here, working on the river nearby and that sort of thing. So that sort of things, I feel like I was really, you know, I, I did quite well in as a teenager. Um, but I guess on the social side of things, I was very, you know, I found it very hard to connect with people. Mm. Um, and I had this, just this, so I, don't, I still to this day don't know exactly why, but I always had this feeling that everybody thought I was a bit of an idiot, 
that they would just be laughing at me. After they'd talk to me, they'd be nice on the surface. I would just have, always have this feeling that people would just be kind of laughing at me when they turned away or they'd make jokes about me behind my back, that sort of mm -hmm. thing. Probably from schooling years, you know, very heavily bullied at school. So, um, so I always had that all the way through, which kind of stops your social. You can't really engage trying to develop new deep friendships when you feel like everybody thinks you're, um, you know, a bit of a joke. Mm -hmm. That's kind of like the feeling you, you had, I had. Um, so yeah, so we're from Australia and we did some traveling around Australia and um, that sort of thing. And as, as you know, as young, young married with only a couple of kids at that stage and um, really opened our eyes. We, we were very locked into the conservative Christian circles until we started traveling. And then we started chatting to other Christians and just experiencing life outside the bubble. I really started to open our eyes. And I think our journey of growth started during the year that we traveled around Australia, the caravan. And um, we both, my wife and I are both very, well, I'm an ENFP and she's an INFP, INFJ, sorry. And those personality types are very growth focused naturally. So mm -hmm. I, I would always be reading self-help books and I would always be trying to grow. Would we'll always just hit a barrier and stop, you know? Mm -hmm. I would always get to a point and like my emotional maturity was a, I just couldn't, I couldn't get through this, this lack of self-worth I had. It just killed everything dead until, um, yeah, until the affair was revealed and then at that point um it was in a discussion with a uh, with an older gentleman who we actually had some respect for he was our landlord at the time and um lovely lovely christian man and in the discussion there was nothing profound that he said but he just said one sentence in it all that just something clicked in it deep and it was just wow like i it, and it was affecting my, my yeah, like I said before, my my self worth. I was able to not. I was able to then begin to start breaking that cycle of shame. You know, that mm -hmm. cycle of guilt and trying. Um, so yeah, that's that's yeah, and that's, we've chatted about that. So five years of of <laughs> well, a lot of hell. Really, it was it wasn't a very pleasant time, and it was well. Looking back, you think, how the heck? Periods in there where we would just, well, often I would just get into bed at the end of the day and just think, wow, like, how do we get through today? You know, because it wasn't just marriage <laughs> building, like, we were, we, our, our beliefs had grown, outgrown the, the Christian circle that we lived in. It was very, the community was a very tight community. So, mm -hmm. working with my parents on the farm, you know, and everybody from my childhood was all um, of that same mind, those same thinking, same values, same traditions. And we were growing apart from that because of our journey and what we were finding <laughs> out. And, and so there's a lot of pressure there and then a lot of other external pressures. And But through all of that, I guess we, we just developed this real desire to help people from it because right from right within like a year of you know a rebuilding uh, people kept coming to our path who just you know just been revealed that they said the husband had an affair and they didn't have anybody to talk to and say so friend mm. told a friend who told a friend who said oh you you know we're, we're and so that we got connected and we would chat and share experience and they, they'd really get help from just being able to talk to somebody who'd been through it Mm -hmm. and who was willing to talk you know and um i think that really fueled our desire to help people because mm -hmm. you know your, your biggest challenges that you work through become your biggest passions well it, it is that way for us and um we just kept growing, growing and as we slowly slowly got more and more on top of our relationship that desire just kept building and building until we couldn't kind of stop it anymore but we, we have to ask and, um and so we did and and then it's just grown and grown and it's still growing and it, i think it always will you know and this is one of these lifelong 
enterprises, I suppose. Mm. Uh, help us Have we frozen? Yeah. <laughs> yes, we have. Or at least you. <coughs> or it might oh, be no. on, on my end. And my internet is not good. I, I have no idea. But yeah, you froze up there for a second. That's quite all right. So you got five kids, right? Right now. Yes. Oh, that's that, that's yes. just amazing. Um, so I, I'm just wondering because, you know, you, you mentioned like you had a certain childhood. Um, how has that formed you? Uh, and made you now as a father? What kind of things are you doing the same? What kind of things are you doing different? What have you learned from your experience as a child that you now are adapting as a, as a father? Mm -hmm. This is a good question. Of the questions. So, <clears throat> I guess uh, I have to admit to the first five or six years of fatherhood, of being very not of, of not being very present, you know, mm -hmm. being so caught in my own stuff that I really was. The, the older two kids, you know, to be brutally honest, didn't have much of a father. You know, I was always there, and we were always and we were quite legalistic at the beginning. Um, so you know, everything was fairly black and white, and consequences and boundaries are very tight, that sort of thing. Um, but obviously over our journey and have been dealing with a lot of child, my own child areas and, and growing from that, I think, to try and answer your question, I think what I've tried to bring into my parenting is, is awareness. Mm. Um, because I feel like one that, one of the biggest things I guess I missed as a child was an acceptance and an awareness of who I was and I guess what my needs as, a, as an individual were. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not pointing any fingers or whatever. I've just, just, I've just identified what was. And um, so I've tried to bring a lot of awareness in. You know, I've, I spend a lot of time trying to understand mm. why the kids are doing what why they are the way they are what makes them tick um I've, i keep diving more and more into what personality i can i can sense from them and um as they get older it gets a little bit easier um i'm still a bit bamboozled by our five-year <laughs> to be perfectly honest as to you know he's very full on uh awesome kid but extremely full on so trying to um yeah navigate we none of our other kids were quite that full on you know so we're and, and they're all completely different so it's trying mm. to bring awareness for every different child i think that's that's probably the biggest thing coming from my childhood yeah hey sorry for the interruption i know you're really enjoying the show just want to make sure if you're liking this information Please subscribe and um, press the like button. And also, go visit becomeafearlessfather.com. You get the opportunity to share your biggest challenge at the moment as a father. And it gives me the opportunity to try and help you overcome this. Thanks, and enjoy the rest of the show. Exactly, yeah, because that was going to be one of my other questions. Is like, you know, with five kids, uh, I got two, and sometimes it's already difficult to make sure that both of them feel the same amount of love, get the same amount of attention, uh you got five it's like whew. <laughs> so yeah. how, how do you do that like my my first thought would be like i got a whiteboard here and i just write everybody's name down and just make some check boxes or something it sounds really old school but you know just to make sure that everybody gets at least like i don't know 15 minutes of just pure focus yeah. and attention right so how, how yeah. do you how do you get that worked out between you and your wife? Mm. Yeah, it's got to be just a job on its own, twenty four seven. Well, it is. It is. I, I guess we're lucky in that sense. We there was a big gap between our first two mm. and our third. So William is five and Ivana is twelve. So there's there's seven. There was seven years gap. So there's yeah, and then the others are then they're five and three. So there's 
Hmm. Um, that kind of works. If they were all equally spread out, it would, I think it would be a lot harder. Mm -hmm. um, but I can kind of focus on the older two. And because there's enough gap, I can then focus on the younger three more as a, yes, they need their individual time, but as, as really younger kids, that it's not as much. Whereas the older mm -hmm. two definitely need their individual focus. Um, and I did struggle a lot with that. That's something I've had to be really, really intentional um, on getting getting that balance. And I'll, I don't know, Tom will only tell if I've got that right and I'm <coughs> forever mm. trying to... And I, I've got nothing as, as organised as a whiteboard or anything. <laughs> um, I guess my, I'm lucky in a sense. My wife is very intuitive. Um, mm. I call her the barometer. So I have to remember to ask her, like, how do you feel the children are as far as what they need and that sort of thing? And and when I have those conversations with her, because um, of her personality, she won't necessarily bring it up. But if I ask her, she'll tap into something and go, yeah, well, I feel like Michael will need this and Ivana will need that and um, the other kids will need this and this and this. Or she can kind of sense when things are getting a bit out of, proportion which is really I guess that's what works for us is um yeah we're both I guess very intuitive as mm. far as as that goes um yeah whereas if we were different personalities and absolutely you know we'd need the whiteboard we'd need far more structured but I think it's working for us just um but it hasn't been natural for me to put the time aside like I could spend every valuable minute doing stuff mm -hmm. and having you know especially working with a business and I still work part-time in my trade and so life is very full mm -hmm. you know I could spend every valuable minute doing things you know but putting an hour aside here you know putting two hours aside here going oh you know this is this is more important right now um, I think having done my core values, actually, I, something that really helped me, I'll be over a year ago now, I, I'd never heard of core values as a thing and I stumbled across them and I did the, did the core values exercise and it just really, really resonated with me. It put my three most important values in life very clear. Mm -hmm. And it was really useful for me. I know for, it's more useful for some people than others, but for me, it was really, really useful because I could, anything that I was going to spend time on, I could think, you know, because relationship is one of them. And that, to me, that in, that's family. That's, you know, mm -hmm. my wife, it's family, it's other relationships, quality time, all of that comes under relationship. And even business, you know, Future, any of that is not as important to me as as family as relationships so that that really that was really good exercise to me um, and I think that really helped you know because we would find ourselves you know like a five-year-old was really challenging um, when he was say three and four he um, he would have there were a lot of trouble going to sleep at night and we would have to sit in there with him. Um, and then he would get into a habit of it. Um, and he's one of those kids who just will keep bouncing out. You know, no matter what you do, if you didn't sit in there with him, he'd just come and bounce out. And, oh, and it, yeah, so you had to. And then, so then we'd get into a habit of that. And then the older kids would, you know, their, their bit of time before they had to go to bed would suffer. And, um, we, you know, that things like that would come up. And so then we'd have to really, we're going to have to change something significantly. And so we'd have to try and rework his whole bedtime schedule, you know, try to get him, if he's had naps late, make sure that he only had them early and, you know, do all the things that would help him sleep. Um, transition him into the fact that, you know, we were just going to put him to bed and go out, you know, so over a, like three week period, just kind of weaned him off it. And he was at a point where that would happen. And yeah, you know, there's all these sorts of challenges and things. 
every parent has. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I, I got to say, especially when you mentioned intention and intentionality, right? So to be really intention, to focus on just what is most important to you. Now, I know you said core values. That's been a key for you. And maybe for somebody else, it's not. I think uh, core values is important for absolutely everybody. And the reason why I'm saying that is I have noticed a while back that when my kids would come in now, right, which they do often, uh, I would get upset. Like my first interviews, I would get upset. Like actually my second interview, my son actually made a, a huge pile of shit on the floor in my office right before I had to go on. And I was just fuming, right? And yeah. that's where that where those core values come in and handy. What's just most important, which I think reduced my impatience. I'm a very impatient person, and I'm I'm very high energetic. And if things don't go high energetic like I want to, then whoop. so having those core values really helped me to say, okay, yeah, yeah, you know, what's most important? And no, 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 my kids are most important. My my relationship with my kids, my wife, that's most important. So if something happens then i can just drop and say i don't even have to apologize unapologetically follow your core values is such a blessing that i absolutely understand where you come from so i appreciate you sharing that um having gone through everything you've gone through and now being where you at i'd like to know what is your philosophy on happiness happiness Mm -hmm. Mm. Um, happiness. I'm only pausing because it's something I have put a lot of thought towards. And I think there's just so much, so much different language around it. Mm-hmm. That, um, yeah, it's easy to say things that don't, necessarily get the core of what we're trying to say Mm -hmm. Um, okay so on a really basic level to me happiness is something that you can be intentional about Mm -hmm. Um, because I've been in a lot of my life just reacting to life and sometimes I was enjoying it and sometimes I wasn't, you know. And having gone through five or six years of utter incredible kind of non-stop stress, pressure, mm-hmm. um, no sleep, um, just un- unrelenting. Um, we discovered the power of intentional gratitude mm-hmm. and intention focusing on Focusing on what, filtering out what we can, couldn't, couldn't, couldn't control. Mm. I think um, learning to, and this is always an ongoing thing. I'm not at all suggesting that we've we've got happiness dialed. Um, however, I know personally, I'm naturally my mood is more naturally up anyway. Uh, mm. that, that is part of, apart from when I was in the, yeah, in my horrible depression point. But apart from that, um, my mood is generally more up than most, but even still, just trying to think about like, the growth that I've done in the last couple of years I think I got to a point where I was just going to approach every day and just enjoy it for what it was. Mm. You know, I've been in a lot of mindfulness, um, becoming far more aware of footprint. And I think I had just decided this was it wasn't actually a conscious choice. I suddenly realized that I was just choosing to focus on what I was going to take the good out of all the situations. I think that that's, that's what it was. 
Mm. And, um, and I think it really came to light for me because um, one, of the, one of the other workers at my, at my work, um, he's a funny bloke, but he, he keeps asking me, how was your day? And I say, oh, it's fantastic. And he just thinks it's the, he just thinks it's the funniest thing. But I always say, oh, my day was fantastic. You know, I've been crawling around in a roof and it's been 40 degrees and like Celsius. And, um, you know, or I've been doing some mundane job that's normally really mindless. And, you know, there's just, I find, I think I just naturally look now to what is, what good there is in everything. And that works for me. I know that may not necessarily work for everybody either, but um, I think that's my philosophy. I haven't, I'm just verbalizing this because I've not actually thought that one through. But getting to a point where you can genuinely just try to always be present, aware, and focused on what the good is, what the benefits, and what you can be grateful for in each situation. Mm -hmm. um, yeah but it has to come from a place it's not just one of those things you can just uh flick a switch mm -hmm. you know there has to be some work done i think to to integrate different parts of yourself to get to that point i believe um but having that intention is always good um, mm -hmm. i'm not saying you can't you just might have to be more intentional about it until it becomes more natural, perhaps. Yeah. But I think that's what I mean. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's not something that just goes like, oh, yeah, now, now I got it. I just see all good and everything, right? It's a continuous intention focus on doing it. And actually, when you're talking about it, it reminded me of a story that my mom told me. She had a friend who was always positive to people, like always. He would find something and then just give you a compliment. And they were sitting in the car and this guy was just absolutely just a bad person, right? There was nothing nice about him. There was absolutely nothing nice or good that anybody could say about him. He's just mean to the bone. And right before they left, because my mom was just waiting for like, this guy is going to say something nice because that's the way he is, right? And at the end, he leaves and he asks, ah, by the way, where are you from? And he says, the city he says, that's a very nice city. And they left. I'm like... <laughs> That's just awesome. That's, you know, that's the intention in, in just making sure that you leave on a positive note, even like it was absolutely horrible. I thought of the story, I thought I'd share it real quick because I thought I fit real yeah. well in what you mentioned, just being intentionally and finding the good yeah. in every situation. So uh, I really appreciate that. <laughs> Sorry about that. So um, you you've been through um and i want to go to to in, in in regards to marriage i want to go into a little bit deeper as well but you've been through stuff which makes you very valuable and have a lot of experience and insights to share right what do you or in your opinion is the role of a husband hey. um Sorry, can I just jump to the window? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you can join. <laughs> the role of a husband. <sighs> That's interesting. I have my, my views, I guess, very, very different to probably a lot of other people. Um, That's why I ask. <laughs> yeah, not, only for the point of view that and I don't know it's a personality thing I know it is very much a personality thing of the NFPs to um, right and wrong is not something that resonates with me um, mm -hmm. it, it, it absolutes I don't do absolutes um, try to pin me down to anything very specific I mean, obviously, I do have very strong opinion, you know, thoughts on a lot of things, but I can see, I can see both sides of just about everything. Mm -hmm. um, well, as far as I'm aware, you know, um, <laughs> there's obviously areas where I can't. Uh, we've all got our blind spots. But so when it comes to, you know, say the role of a of a husband. I guess 
I guess I just don't really resonate with the word role um, because mm. to me, I've come with a very strict background. The role of a husband was always talked about. I very much disagree with most of it. Mm. Um, but perhaps that's just my personal view of not having good experience with that. But I, what it, to me, what it is, As a husband, I feel like the only real role is to try to grow to be your most, I don't like using the word authentic either, the most you you can be. So to be the, the best version of myself mm. so that I can just show up as myself and that is a good thing as opposed to how I always did show up as myself. <laughs> that was generally a negative thing in our relationship, um, mm. you know, because of immaturity. So I'm, I guess I'm talking about growing in maturity, but at the same time, a lot of people and myself included, I had very low self-worth. I wasn't, I didn't see myself as valuable. Mm. So that inhibited me from showing up. That inhibited me from taking action when I should have. You know, that inhibited me from pursuing connection when I should have. Um, so there's a, a line between going on, a, on an emotional maturity growth path and learning who you are and growing into who you really are, not what's expected of you as far as not what other people are putting on you rather. Mm -hmm. So then, so then the role from there is that you can just engage in life and in your marriage and in your relationship from that, from that place. And And then stuff just happens from there. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm not trying to be vague about it, but when I try to get more into specifics, it narrows it down too much for me because everybody is so different. Mm -hmm. Every relationship is so different. Um, mm -hmm. And typical, you know, for instance, okay, so Western culture, Western society, we have a very, in my view, we have a very strong bias towards a certain type of, say, masculinity, mm -hmm. what a man looks like, mm -hmm. which is very much action, physical, orientated, you know, able to chop a load of firewood and go and shoot, a, shoot an animal and then fix his car at the same time. You know, that, that kind of whole masculinity thing, and then that breeds into the relationship. There's, there's like this... I guess it's breaking down more with how it is multicultural goes, but still there's these kind of expectations and cultures around Western society. And if you go to other countries, it's completely different. Mm -hmm. In African nations, it's completely different. In Japan, it's completely different. You know, in European countries, that whole... Um, so the role, I feel like, is whatever, whatever is the most truest version of you, mm -hmm. and then also for your wife, if you can actually show up as that to your best of your ability, then you won't need to try to fit into society, what society says as roles and what is masculine and feminine and because, because that will work for you, mm -hmm. you know? You might, not, you might be more of an intuitive thinker type of person, academic, who isn't, can't take that strong you know i'm gonna set rules and i'm going to um make everything happen you might be somebody who just influences mm -hmm. more than than direct you know what i mean like yeah but the, the point is i think i'm taking a long way around of saying it That's fine. i think the point is is that you can become confident in who you are mm -hmm. and how you do show up in your in your relationship i think the point is is that I guess your role, Mark, the role is to become confident in yourself because whatever you do become confident in 
and that does work in your relationship dynamics, then that's right for your relationship. Mm. Um, you're not as opposed to being unsure, you know, and then that leads to not being intentional and that leads to conflict because, you know, and then so it goes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I just want to mention as well, when I was writing this, well, just a short thing of the question, I was thinking like, okay, am I going to talk about role or am I just going to ask what makes a good husband? I should have gone with the second one. But as no, no, it was good. you were had the discussion. Yeah, no, no, no. But sometimes I just, you know, as an interviewee you, or as an interviewer, you can also put a little blame on yourself if something doesn't come out the way it should because sometimes you don't ask the question as right as it should be. In this case, absolutely, I should have gone with the other one. I realized it too late. So, uh, but you, you explained it very well. The two things that I picked up that I really like is, you know, you focus on yourself, you make yourself grow to become the best that you can be. But one of the things, and it, it slips in there every single time. And I really like that it slipped in there when you were talking about the kids and it slips in there now again, as you talk about being a husband and that is understanding. Try to understand the other person. And that is absolute key and not very often thought of. And I, I read the book Curious uh, a week, two weeks ago, and that was also one of the things. You just have to try and understand. And it also came up again in the book uh, The Seven Habits of Stephen Covey, where he says, you know, you cannot come to – if you are both in an argument, you cannot come to a situation where you both win if you do not understand or try to understand the other person's view. So um, I just wanted to alliterate a little bit on that. So I hope that people pick that up because that is and something I, I am working on very hard. I have noticed lately that those are <laughs> in our house because of that. So I appreciate you mentioning that because it's absolutely key. Um, yeah. <coughs> I apologize, sorry people. The throat just does not like me at all. Um, so, everything you've been through, you must have some... Man, I'm starting to really dislike the word secrets <laughs> for some reason, but some tips, some things that can really help us um, to, to make and keep a marriage going because I actually, I, I speak lately, I seem to speak often about this topic because I just keep hearing of that one got divorced, that one got divorced. Uh, I'm not even talking about all the famous couples that we see, right? It's like they're married one moment and they're like divorced the next, right? There's no consistency in let's go from like we get married until we just grow old. Man, yeah. you've guys been through a lot, so you must have some really nice tips of you know how, how do you continue to fight to make your marriage work mm. yes you're right there is a lot in there um to try to pull out a few points i suppose let's see what's some of the more important ones um Obviously, for us at the beginning of the, the new beginning of the journey, there was that willingness. I think that was, mm. which to be fair, most couples have that willingness, you know, until you don't anymore. Um, so we had, there was a willingness, and that, but I'm very cautious with that because. Every situation is so different. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to put that on anybody else. You know, if if it's a really bad situation, it's very contextual. Like, I don't have a specific view that everybody should necessarily try to stay together. You know, if there is, if there's really really unhealthy dynamics, and it's and somebody is going to keep getting hurt if you stay together. You know, but so but aside from that, like let's just say couples that haven't gone through 
you know, something really big, but I just, just clashing all the time, you know, you know, growing apart or there's just always conflict. Um, which then can lead to things like affairs or um, even what you might call emotional affairs, which are still just as dramatic, but nothing. And so then it all adds to the, you know, to, to the whole mix. So yes, there, there definitely has to be a willingness for it to continue. That is the first one. And then, again, <laughs> this is a very complex issue and question. This is from our experience and what we've observed, what I've observed and learnt, is that I believe the husband hold, does hold the key to a certain degree in, in all of this. Um, and other people disagree with me on this, but I've seen it again and again, and I, I feel it to be true. The husband does hold a key to all of this in that I feel men have the ability to be able to see this is, again is very general. Mm -hmm. um, there are very obviously exceptions to all of this, but in general, I feel like men have the ability to, if they can, if they are shown or if they realize a bigger picture, um, they have the ability to work on themselves. Like if they're going to re-engage, try to guess, either rebuild or try to bring a, a relationship which is full of conflict back into a good relationship again. Um, you know, are a lot of times, like the people that we see, the wife has just said, oh, like, this is enough. You know, I've had enough. Or I'm getting very, very close to having enough. And it's like a wake-up call. Mm -hmm. um, and you very often be oblivious to... Because I feel like... I'm going up a tangent here, but in general, women will, can tend to stay in a relationship for so long past... There's just limits that they will just go past and hang in there and hang in there and hang in there thinking that things are going to change. And eventually when they get to a point where I've had enough, there it's been like, they don't just do it lightly. You know, it's not a, you know, and they've generally put a lot of effort in. Mm. And what happens in those situations is going back to what I was saying before, where the key that the husband can hold is that if it is the situation where the wife has had enough or there's just been so much conflict that she's just not trying anymore, if you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So if we're lacking immaturity, and I'm not saying that in any kind of derogatory way, but like if we haven't developed things within ourselves, that's kind of like too much. Well, she's just not trying. What's the point of trying? We should separate. And in some situations, you know, you, I can't say, you know, sometimes that may be necessary, but if, if it is a case of wanting to make it all work, I feel like there's a point where a woman in general, again, this is general, has an emotional barrier that goes up when they feel like they are needed in order to make a husband feel okay or to be okay. So mm -hmm. I guess this is coming from a husband's point of view because that's who I work with and I work with the men and that. So a lot of the times when we haven't developed our own maturity, you know, we haven't got our childhood issues sorted out. We actually end up trying to get needs met from our wife on a conscious or subconscious level. So validation, needing our wife to react a certain way or if she becomes critical, then we get upset or if she does this, then we get angry or if she does that and we, you know, we withdraw or, you know, if then she apologizes, then we come back, you know. So a lot of the time we as husbands can be very reactive to and needy in a sense of our wife to be a certain way. You know, if only my wife would, you know, stop being so blah, 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 then I could, 
whatever. So there's this, and women on a subconscious level sense that. They may not be able to verbalize it, but there's a barrier that goes up when they're needed, when they need to be a certain way in order for their husband to be okay in himself. They can't, they just cannot engage on any deeper level in that relationship as to what level the husband is at when it comes to is he needing his wife to be a certain way to be all right? You know, do I need my wife to validate me? Um, do I need her to, to be very appreciative before I'll, or I'll get upset or offended? You know, so if she's needing to, to act or say things a certain way or all of that sort of thing, it keeps an emotional barrier up. They can't open up and engage when just because of the physical dynamics of it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So where I say that the husbands hold a key is, is that as we grow in ourselves, as we take responsibility for our own emotions, our own reactions, as we take responsibility for the fact that we don't need our wives to be a certain way for us to be okay, you know, can we feel our own needs? Can we feel all our own love languages? In that sense, can we be, take complete responsibility for our lives? And that's one of the things I teach, you know, taking complete responsibility for our own selves, our own lives. Mm -hmm. The more we do that, it kind of raises the level that they can then engage with us. And so it's almost like the other image, image I like to use is a bit like, like a, a lighthouse with, with waves that come and, you know, hit against the base of it, you know, that, that image where us being the lighthouse as men and the waves either being our wife or any other events in life coming and, and whacking against us, when something happens, does it send us in a spin, you know? Do we, does it knock us out for weeks or days, you know? Do we fire a fly off the handle and get angry, you know? Do we not be able to cope with it with what happens and i'm not saying that we need to have everything together but it's just that there is a level just on a purely just the way the dynamics work where as we take responsibility for ourselves as we grow in our own emotional maturity then our wife can if she's you know, even if, even if our wife hasn't got, you know, our, our wives all have their own stuff going on. Like, we all know that, you know, they've all had their own childhoods. They've all got their own things that they're working through, their own emotional maturity. Mm. And they may very well be needing us to be a certain way for them to be okay. You know, that dynamic always works both ways. But the more that we as men can be like the lighthouse that the wave comes and crashes and we're still just there afterwards. Mm. You're still just engaged, you know, th that kind of thing. Then that really starts to build some emotional trust, I like to call it. Mm -hmm. Where I can, as a wife, I can be myself in all my messiness and my husband's still there. You know, he's still himself. He's still solid in himself. Mm. That's when magic can really start to happen as far as a wife then becoming to grow and becoming willing to do our own growth journey, you know, because it's extremely hard for a wife to engage in a growth journey when the husband is still emotionally immature uh, because a wife naturally, again, this is general, but a wife will naturally want to do that journey with her husband because mm -hmm. she'll want that connection. You know, she will want to do the journey together. Mm -hmm. And if the husband's not, working on any kind of emotional maturity, if we're just plodding through life, not doing anything, she's wanting to do this growth journey generally, and she doesn't, but the only way for her to grow if our, us as husbands won't grow, she'll have to separate herself emotionally from us, and she'll have to work on her own things separately. Mm -hmm. But that's really hard for women to do, because they love that connection, but that's, that's what they want in their relationship. So as we can grow in, in our own emotional maturity, then they, that gives over a period of time, it builds up like enough emotional trust in themselves that I can start becoming more vulnerable. I can start opening up more. I can start doing my own work. I can grow as well and we can do it together. 
Mm. You know, I guess that that dynamic I think is the most healthy that I've I've seen. When it gets to that point where we can now both grow together, because you're doing it and you're having that connection, um, you're both on the same page. You're both starting to understand each other better, you know, and so it goes. But you can do your own growth completely without your partner. Like if you're in a situation where your partner just, for whatever reason, is not of any kind of growth, you can do your own growth. And it, it is still really, really important. You can't put off your own growth because this is your life, you know? This is... And if you don't grow, then nothing will ever change and improve, you know? And if you do do your own work and then growth, you know, and that may cause a bit of conflict in the relationship initially, like put your own work in because it's changing, change, change adds different dynamics, you know, it makes it very uncomfortable. Mm. But, um, but generally, I think if, Let's just say we're talking about the husband. If the husband begins the growth journey, gets him with a good group of you know, starts really working on his on on his own own stuff and starts to really grow, one of two things will happen. Either the wife will respond and start to grow as well, mm -hmm. or they'll grow apart. Because that seems like because um but either way. You know, especially if you're bringing up children, if you you really don't want to be in the place of immaturity when you're kind of 50 still, you know, and you've, you've been in, you know, your children are adults and you've still got these unhealthy dynamics going on. You know, growth has to happen. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not sure if that actually answers the question in the end. No, no, it's absolutely um, great because it reminded me of, uh, of I think, like, a year ago where I was really struggling with with my wife and it was actually that what you mentioned it's like I was needing from her uh, um, something that she wasn't giving and 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 well something I wanted sex <laughs> a lot of times and she wasn't giving it to me and in my head that was like okay she's not she's not kissing me she's not hugging me right now so she doesn't love me and that just you know and that makes you angry and blah 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 and and that's or at least from what I've understood, that's that's what you're talking about. And now that I am on my my own growth journey, now it doesn't bother me anymore. And we actually have more sex than we did before. So um, don't know how that works, but hey, it's working. So now everybody's happy. But if it doesn't happen, then I'm okay with it now as well, right? So I think if I understood you correctly, that's what you're talking about. One of the things that I did come across yeah. that, that was really scary at first was uh, when I started to discover what you just mentioned, like, you know, you have to own your own, you're, you're responsible for, for your own, you know, everything <laughs> that is happening around yep. you um, is communicating with my wife in such a way that, you know, Hey, this is what's on my mind. This, this is, if now if it comes up, I just share it with her right away. But in, I'm still struggling a little bit with in such a way that she's not, you know, because it's not her fault. It's mine. <clears throat> that at first was really, really difficult for me. It's like at first was afraid to communicate like those deep feelings. And then I was afraid to like, hmm, how am I going to communicate this in such a way that it doesn't affect her, that, that you know, it, it doesn't put a negative thing yeah. on her, right? So, um, yeah, I absolutely understand where yeah. you're coming from. I really appreciate that. <coughs> um, man, we threw an hour. It went fast, David. It went wow. Like that. Yeah, exactly. So I always have the last question, David, for fathers that are watching this now or watching the recording, you know, how can they stay in contact with you? Um, how can they, if they have some more questions in regards to what you shared, um, you know, ask those questions. What's, what's the best ways? Awesome. Probably the best way is um, if you head over to the Breakthrough Barriers community. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm always in there in the group. And if you've got questions, it's ideal because everybody else gets to benefit as well. Mm -hmm. However, I guess if it's something fairly a bit more personal, then, um, you know, I'm always available on, on the messenger, uh, you know, Facebook messenger to, 
you know, some initial conversations for sure, you know, and then if, if, if you're really desperate and you really want some help, then absolutely. Yes. I, I do do one-on-one -on -one work. Um, mm -hmm. Not, not a lot because, um, yeah, I'm moving away from one-on-one -on -one work because of the community and I'm, Mm -hmm. um, I've got the group mentoring program running, so mm -hmm. that um, the Own Your Legend group programming, so a program, so probably heading over the group is is probably awesome. And you know, if it's something quite personal, then yeah, yeah, for sure, contact me on Messenger, and I'll I'll absolutely have a chat. Awesome. The links, of course, for the people that are watching the recording are, as always, uh, below. Uh, so, David, again, thank you so much for taking the time to be on. Uh, I really appreciate it. And uh, thanks for all your uh, insights and especially your honesty about, you know, where you go, what you've been through and where you go towards right now. I really appreciate that. Everybody's been watching this. Thanks again for joining us. Uh, we will see each other very soon. Take care. Absolutely. Thank you. Are you still meeting up with your friends now that you're a father? Kids making you stress out, you got no time for yourself to work out, read, relax. Can you still remember the time you were hanging out with your friends, feeling energetic, happy and confident? Spending time together and talking about your life and your crazy dreams. You're feeling alone now, don't you? no one to share your challenges with and you're just running around from one storm into the next well it's time to change this now join me and the brotherhood of fearless fathers to speak on a weekly basis with like-minded dads to crush your challenges face your fears with determination be held accountable and regain control of your life if you want to become the hero your family needs you to be, then go to becomeafearlessfather.com slash brotherhood. Looking forward to seeing you on one of our next calls.